No, it's because everybody else is a sellout to Satan. They're sacrificing to Satan and they're part of the New World Order, but not you. That's the only reason you don't have nice things, but at least you have this secret knowledge unlike those sheeple over there. It's a total con! Hey everyone, it's Rachel. We have a serious problem. I'm talking about like a major problem and I'm not just talking about, oh, it's a crack your Bible problem. No, this is an entire body of Christ problem. And what I was going to talk about this week, I can't talk about it right now because we have to address this issue. After the response that I got to my video last week, about false prophets and how God deals with them, I realized how pervasive this problem is and it's going to lead to people going to hell. People who think that they're very religious and, oh, I go to church and I have my Bible verses on my social media profile. These people are going to end up in hell because nobody's talking about this issue in churches. The Bible talks about it, so we're going to talk about it right now. Let's get started. But like Before we jump into anything else, let's just get started. Let's crack your Bible over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're also going to be talking about Ephesians 5 and Revelation 2 and the church of Thyatira. So let's just start from the jump, okay? So 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. So they're never happy. Nothing can make them happy. They're always upset about something slanderous. So they're always lying about other people or making up stuff about other people that is not true without self-control. You see a lot of people will suddenly get called on their bad behavior. And then all of a sudden they magically, Oh, I'm struggling with my mental health as if that's an excuse. No, they have they are without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, so they're backstabbers, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. People act like God is just some sort of concept instead of a real physical entity that exists that has all power and all might to just end it all right now if he wanted to. He's not just a concept. He actually exists. He spoke the world into motion. So these people, they have the appearance of godliness. Oh, I'm so religious. I go to church. I love Jesus. But they forget that God is real and has power. So they're denying his power by their behavior. Avoid such people. I want you to highlight verse 6 and 7. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Let's go over that one more time. I want you to think about what we're reading here. For among them, so the people who act like what we just read, are those who creep into households and capture weak women, Burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. So think about that. How many people, it doesn't have to necessarily be women, it can be women or men, but it tends to be a lot of women, let's be honest, who are involved in all sorts of sin. Maybe they have a past in the new age or the occult, they are into astrology and tarot cards or maybe they used to be in some sort of like deviant relationship behavior, if you know what I mean. I have to work with the algorithm in YouTube. You know, maybe they're involved in that kind of sin. Or maybe it's something like fraud or theft, like they shoplift or something. You know, they're burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. So these women are very naive, but they also struggle with all of these sins that they either used to commit or are still committing. And they have all of these pet projects that they love, all of these various passions, and they're always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. 
And why is that? Because these women are not cracking their Bible. These women are not spending their time building themselves up in their most holy faith by studying the word of God. They are not meditating on the word of God. Instead, they're so wrapped up in their various passions and their politics and their personality cults and all of the sins that they are involved in that they are easily targeted by these People who creep into households and take these weak women captive with deceptive teachings. And these women, because they're naive, oh, I'm studying under so-and-so. I'm studying under so-and-so. Oh, I like this pastor. Oh, I like this politician. You know, they're always learning about all of these deep truths, right? But they're never able to arrive at the knowledge of the actual truth, the real truth. That is Christ Jesus. That's why they're always being swindled by these con men, these grifters, these wolves in sheep's clothing, who Jesus warned us against. What it literally, let's look at wolves in sheep's clothing. Some of you guys don't know verses by heart. So here's how you find it. Look at that. Matthew 7, 15. We're on Bible Gateway. So what did Jesus say? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So all of these wackadoodle grifter quacks who are always teaching all of these mystical hidden truths and all of this crazy conspiracy garbage, you can see that the fruit that they're bearing is not good fruit. This is why Jesus goes on to say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's not that these people fell away from the faith. Jesus says, I never knew you. I never knew you. You were always a, a, a stranger to me. You can see it with these grifters, these false prophets. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock and the rain fell and the floods came, but the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So if your house is not built upon the rock, the foundation, which is Christ Jesus, it's built on, oh, well, I followed this person or I'm part of this political party or, oh, I'm part of this group. We, the people, blah, blah, blah. Like if it's built on anything other than Christ Jesus, your house is going to fall and it's going to be a great fall. Jesus tells us that there will be a great falling away in the last days because so many people do not have their foundation in Christ Jesus. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because of the response that I received on my last video. So if you guys remember five days ago, I did a video about false prophet Jeff Jansen and we talked about how Jeff Jansen has not only just one false prophecy, but he had many false prophecies over the years. And not only that, he had left his wife. He was involved in some sort of um, relationship sin. It sounded like his church was alluding to before they like 
let him go and then brought him back for a while. But anyway, last week he put out a prophecy that because Trump was being investigated by the FBI, this was like gasoline on the fire and uh, he's going to emerge victorious along with all of his like followers and blah, blah, blah. So he made this big false prophecy and then less than 16 hours later, he was dead. Killed over, dead. And we talked about how in Deuteronomy chapter 18, so if you do know the verse, you can just type in Deuteronomy 18. I know it's verse 20, but let's just read it. It says that, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? Verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Now, I even had somebody say, oh, Deuteronomy is talking about people who are claiming to be God. Can people even read? Like, stop trying to give me a book report on a verse you didn't even read. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak is not saying somebody's claiming to be God. He's saying, I heard this word from the Lord. He's presuming to speak a word in the name of the Lord that God did not give him that word. God did not tell him that. People, crack your Bible and read before making comments. Oh my gosh. But when people are like, oh, these verses aren't applicable. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This stuff doesn't change. And I really, you know, what I really want to know is this. Crack your Bible over to Ephesians and we'll be around verse 11. Okay, actually, let's back up. Let's start at verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Let's circle back over to Ephesians 5.11. What does it say? Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So does Ephesians 5.11 apply to the body of Christ today? Yes or no? Like, let me know down in the comments. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. You know, people are saying, oh, well, the, New the Old Testament doesn't apply. Okay, so does Ephesians 5.11 apply today? I didn't just get people saying, oh, well, the Old Testament doesn't apply or... Oh, it's not talking about false prophecy. It's about people who are claiming to be God. What? It's not just those people. I don't, I don't know what it is. But like we just talked about in 2 Timothy chapter 3, these weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning but never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth, they still exist today. And they were commenting on my channel. And look at some of the comments that I received and I took screenshots of. Here's Caroline. This was on Facebook. Judge not so you won't be judged. Where is your heart to bind together the body of Christ in unity? What? What are we talking? Judge not so you won't be judged. Let's go look at that whole verse. Judge not that you will not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. 
First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. This whole thing is not saying don't judge people. It's don't judge people hypocritically. Don't talk about false teachers if you're a false teacher kind of thing. But I'm applying the same standard to myself that I apply to all of these other people that I talk about. Because I'm not a hypocrite. But Caroline over here, oh, you shouldn't be judging. As she's judging me, like, do people not even see their own hypocrisy and double standards? Where is your heart to bind together the body of Christ in unity? Unity in what when they're following after false teachers? What are you talking about? Deborah, careful who you call a false prophet. And the man died. Have some respect. Why would I respect somebody who God took out because he was a false prophet leading his flock astray? What is there to respect? Here's somebody calling themselves something, something dream interpreter. You should not be rejoicing and snickering in the death of anyone, young lady. I can tell you that while God doesn't play, he is full of mercy, grace, and love. This is my first time seeing this channel, and those mercy, grace, and love are not the attributes you are displaying in this forum. I'm not familiar with Jeff Jansen's ministry at all, but I do know that no matter what he said or done, God only is the judge and jury concerning his life. Looks like you have some maturing to do, young lady. Think on that. Oh my goodness, we have so much to unpack. So not only does this woman not know Jeff Jansen, but she doesn't know me. But she's comfortable defending somebody that she has no idea who he even is. She automatically gives the, the male dead false prophet the benefit of the doubt to publicly chastise me. So let's unpack this. Oh, uh, God is about mercy, grace, and love. Let's see what God actually says that he's about. Let's crack your Bible over to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices, what? Steadfast love justice and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight declares the Lord so God cares about steadfast love justice and righteousness in the earth so God is not cool with people destroying his flock this is why he is a God of justice and righteousness this is why he calls us to be holy, because he is holy. And some false prophet, wolf in sheep's clothing, who's destroying the, the flock is not holy. They don't get the benefit of the doubt automatically. So let's see what else she said. Uh, God only is the judge and jury concerning his life. Oh, really? Let's crack our Bible yet again. Let's go over to... 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's start at verse 9. Does it say what so-and-so dream interpreter says? That only God is the judge and jury concerning his life. Well, let's crack our Bible and look. Starting at verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Num verse 10. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of this world. If you couldn't associate with any sinner, then you wouldn't, then you would have to leave the world because the world is full of them is what he's saying. But he's saying, I'm not talking about the people who are out in the world. I'm talking about the people inside the church. That you're not supposed to associate with those people. The people inside the church who are doing this kind of stuff. I'm not talking about the rest of the world. Those are the people you minister to. It says, verse 11, But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, brother in Christ, sister in Christ, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reveler, so like somebody who's like constantly partying and orgies and stuff like that, uh, drunkard 
or a swindler. So a grifter, a con man, a quack. Not to even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, is saying we don't, we're not concerned with the people outside the church concerning like those sins. We're concerned with judging the person inside the church who claims to be a brother or sister in Christ who's still doing these things. So Jeff Jansen, Rob Skiba, all of these false dead prophets, we're talking about these people. We're talking about these people. No swindlers. Not even to eat with such one. What have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church you are to judge? I'm supposed to be judging the people inside the church. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Again, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every charge should be established. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I know it's already verse 3. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? We're going to be judging the angels as believers. How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you're going to be judging angels, you should be judging the issues that are coming up between brothers against people within the body of Christ. I, 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 how is this lost on people? Are people just not cracking their Bible? It literally says right here, verse 10, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So these conmen, these false teachers, these people are not brothers in Christ. They are false brothers. They will not inherit the kingdom of God, and yet they constantly have defenders. Let's go look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostle of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So these false teachers, their end will correspond to their deeds. They lie, they swindle, they cheat, they're conmen, they're quacks. Their end is befitting the sins that they were committing within the body of Christ. They drop dead. Paul even talks about it. You go further down. In verse 19, he says, You gladly bear with fools, being wise yourself. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. Like, it's just ridiculous. Like, you guys will put up with so much garbage, but then y'all have a whole lot to say when somebody who's actually preaching the gospel calls these type of people out. And it's not just this wackadoodle. Let's look. Oh, here's Michelle. First, she says that she didn't see what I was writing, even though it was like a link to my video on Facebook, and that she was unable to see it. She says, you better go and stone adulteresses, women, and put your kids to death, too, if you're following the law. Got any New Testament scriptures, love? You're a legalistic, religious, miserable nut. Really? Because I think we've just gone over multiple passages in the New Testament that talks about judging false teachers and not putting up with false brothers and how these false brethren will have an ending, a demise that corresponds to their deeds while they were alive. Let's look. It's not just Michelle. Oh, here's Debbie. Who even knows what she's trying to say? You need to be careful when you dish out judgments against people, especially men of the cloth. Today, you're unrebutted one way, way waxing eloquent as you dish it out. Today, you kick him when he's down. He's dead. He's dead. Each man will give an account for every idle word. Words give life or kill. Your tongue is a platform. God took him out. I just, I don't understand why these people constantly give the benefit of the doubt to false teachers that God has already executed. 
Here's Melissa. How dare you judge another? You will be judged yourself according to scripture. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm not a hypocrite. This is why I use the same standards for myself that I apply to everybody else. This man has a family, but of course you don't care. I care about the family of God. And this man left his wife. Oh my gosh. There's nothing Christian about you. Melissa, crack your Bible. This is what I want to know. Why is it always middle-aged single women who look broke from spending all of their money on scams? Like, oh, their essential oils and their crystals and whatever. They've spent all of their coin on this garbage. But they're always the ones who are tripping over themselves to write me these threatening messages to be careful who you judge. Like, do you really, like, do these women think that these grifters are going to rise from the dead to marry them or something? Like, I I just don't get them. Like, oh, he's he's going to come back from the dead because he's so impressed by how aggressive you're defending his lack of honor. It's like the Holy Spirit already took these con men out, yet these women are still coming to my channel to harp about don't judge or what about unity in the body of Christ or the Old Testament isn't applicable. Apparently these passages from the Old Testament are applicable according to God. Otherwise these false prophet grifters wouldn't be wearing a toe tag today. This is not a one-off event, you guys. Like how many false prophets can you think of that made prophecies about the election or about the pandemic or any, oh, 5G, you know, whatever. They made all of these prophecies. Oh, everybody's going to be dropping dead. Oh, all of these people, there's going to be a red wave. Oh, this person's going to be reinstated in three weeks, in three months, next year, on January. What? Like, and none of these things came to pass. And how many of those people are still alive? Yes, there are people that are still alive, but there's many of them that have dropped dead because God gives people chances, but ultimately there's going to be a time where all of a sudden it's like, nope, he's taken them out. They've, they've crossed the line one too many times and finally God puts his foot down and that prophet dies. You cannot have unity in the body of Christ when false prophets are allowed to, to destroy God's flock. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, so calling people out, for correction and for training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Christians... These verses are always applicable. I want to remind people why we're talking about this again. It's not just because there's these crazy women defending dead false prophets because they have some sort of like psychological issue. Oh, they are burdened with sins. They're naive. They, they're they lonely. They want to feel a part of a group. They think that because they tune into some dude's program every week that he's speaking directly to them and he's like her boyfriend in her mind or something. It's not just that. Because this stuff has always been going on. And if we look at Revelation chapter 2, let's go look at the church of Thyatira. Now, Thyatira was a church and it was southeast of Pergamum and it was famous for like textiles, purple dye, and trade guilds. So you have to understand that up until like the Middle Ages and a little bit even after this, if you were going to work a job, you had to be a part of a guild because everybody was like a, a a craftsman or a tradesman. So you would have like the, the masons or the woodworkers or the idol makers or the cloth dyers or the leather tanners or the potter's guild. And these would be organizations where you would have to join these guilds or these organizations and you would have to participate in their ceremonies. Because remember, in all of these false religions, oh, there's the god of woodworking. 
of craftsmen, of weavers. of So all of these guilds also had their own gods that they worshipped. And they would hold feasts to these various gods, the gods of whatever trade that they had. So to have a job in that area, you had to join a guild, and those guilds worshipped false gods. Now, let's see what was going on in Thyatira. So let's start at verse 19. But I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter exceeds the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent. So when you guys ask me questions, how come some false teachers are allowed to live after they make false prophecies? Because God is giving them a time to repent, but eventually he's going to put his foot down. So verse 21, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, you have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. So this false prophetess who is being likened to a Jezebel, these loving people at the church of Thyatira, they have, they're so loving, are giving credence. They are tolerating a Jezebel teaching false things in their church that are leading to people joining in in the sexual immorality and the food sacrificed to idols, most likely at these guild feasts where they're having orgies and sacrifices and feasts to these false gods. So this false prophetess likened to Jezebel is likely teaching, oh, it's okay to do it because, oh, you know, God knows that you have to make coin, right? So he's saying, you guys are tolerating this stuff. You're okay with it, but I'm not okay with it. And that's why I'm going to throw her onto a sickbed. Her children will die. And the same fate awaits everybody else who is tolerating and not repenting of the sin of following in this false prophet's way. Look at verse 25. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. So this is Jesus talking. It's time for everybody to get real. Like the kid gloves need to come off. Why are we tolerating false prophets? Why are we tolerating false prophets? Do we want to be like the people at the church of Thyatira? Do we want to be the weak women who are burdened with sins, with various passions, always learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth? Is it simply an issue of laziness where people are too lazy to search the scriptures to see if the things that these false prophets are saying line up with scripture? Or are false prophets allowed to go unchecked because there's so many people claiming to be Christian who don't crucify their flesh. It's all about their pride, their ego. That's why they're on the lookout to gather around themselves a many number of teachers who will say whatever their itching ears want to hear. They're looking for somebody to validate their biases, their prejudices, their sinful behavior. Somebody that's going to say, sure, it's fine for you to do that. That It's actually Christian to do that because they don't care about the truth. It's if I agree with it, then it's the truth because it validates my bad behavior. At what point do people say I'm tired of being scammed by con men, grifters, and false prophets? Do you get tired of your witness being absolutely annihilated because you look like a fool? Because you keep following after these grifters? At what point do you say I'm tired of being made a fool by following these false prophets who have had prophecy after prophecy after prophecy not come to pass? 
Do you like being scammed? Do you like being embarrassed? Do you want to end up like the people at the Church of Thyatira? Scripture tells us that swindlers have no part in the kingdom of heaven. So do you want to follow in the footsteps of these false prophets and the false prophetesses who are on their sickbed and their children are dying? The children they've given birth to, the other false prophets that have come after them. Do you want the same fate as the Rob Skibas, the Marcus Lambs, the Irvin Baxters, the Bob Inyards, the Jeff Jansons of this world? They're dead today. Do you want to follow in the footsteps of these false teachers and these false prophets? If not, it's time to have that come to Jesus talk with yourself. Why is it that I'm like the weak women burdened with sins, led astray by various passions, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is it in my past that makes me susceptible to con men and grifters and the things that appeal to my flesh if I'm a Christian who's supposed to crucify my flesh where it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me? Why is it that you act like that? You have to have a real conversation, a come to Jesus moment with yourself. Why is it that I'm so easily swayed by these false prophets, these con men, these grifters, these quacks. Because what it comes down to is there's a lot of lonely people out there. I get it, right? There's a lot of people out there that have gone through trauma, abuse, whatever. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility to deal with the repercussions of the things that you experienced growing up as an adult. You need to take on healthy coping mechanisms. This is why I constantly talk about why Christians need to utilize actual therapy because so many of them have gone through spiritual abuse, sexual abuse, uh, like crazy abusive parents. It's time you have that come to Jesus moment and say, you know what? I understand that I am not dealing with my trauma in healthy ways with other people. It's an insecurity. They see People in their age cohort, maybe in their family, maybe in their neighborhood or something that are doing what they perceive as better than them. Maybe they're more financially well off. Maybe they're smarter. They have nicer things than you. And people get insecure. I don't have anything to show for my life. So I need to find something that validates me, that makes me feel special. So what do they do? Because they're burdened with all of these sins of covetousness, they're jealous, uh, just they have hate in their heart for other people. They are ripe for false teachers. They have all of these passions. Oh, they, they're lovers of money. They're conceited, uh, treacherous, reckless. We've seen that during the entire pandemic. Oh, Jesus is my vaccine. That kind of garbage. Like... We've seen this over and over and over with people, and it's always the people that don't have their life together that are falling for this garbage because they won't have that come to Jesus moment that like, hey, I'm insecure about where I am in my life. I want to feel special, but I don't have the money, the power, the, the things, the trappings of this life that makes me feel like I've achieve something in my life. Therefore, I'm going to seek out this secret hidden knowledge that false prophets have always been promoting. The grifters, the Gnostic con men in the New Testament were promoting the same stuff. This is why you see Paul talk about it over and over and over again in his letters. The People don't realize like how transparent they are. You think that you're hiding your insecurity, but this is why you're getting scammed. There's so many people in the church getting scammed because it's obvious to everybody that you're looking for anybody who will tell you like, no, you don't need to self-reflect. No, you didn't make bad decisions. No, you didn't waste your life. It's somebody else's fault. But here's how you're superior to this very people that you covet. Yeah, sure, they have all the things that you wish you had in your life, but here's how you're superior to those sheeple. It's always playing to your ego. Kid gloves are off. Real talk here. Have you never seen a nature documentary where wolves are going out looking for something to devour? Do they go after the fastest and the strongest in the herd? No, they go after the small ones, the weak ones, the injured ones, because they're easy to spot. They're easy prey to devour. In the same way, weak women burdened with sins led astray by various passions are the weak ones in the herd that are easy to spot, easy to pick off and devour.
And it's not just people who have made poor decisions. False teachers, false prophets, con men will go after the young in the faith too. People that they just don't know any better because they're too new. In the same way that wolves go after the weak and the small, coyotes do the same thing. You'll see a whole pack of coyotes go after young puppies pretending, oh, we're here to play by the fence in the backyard. And the puppy doesn't know any better because they're young, they're new, and the coyotes pretend to play. And then all of a sudden they clamp down and they eat the puppy in the same way these false prophets devour young new believers. Honestly, haven't people caught on to the fact that so many of these false prophets all promote the same sort of lies, especially in the American church? It's always like, oh no, the reason that you don't have the things that you covet of everybody else is not because of the choices that you've made, or it's not because of the policies that the politicians that you keep voting for are implementing. No, it's because everybody else is a sellout to Satan. They're sacrificing to Satan and they're part of the new world order, but not you. That's the only reason you don't have nice things, but at least you have this secret knowledge. Unlike those sheeple over there, it's a total con. Christians, we have got to stop tolerating these quacks and con men. All it's going to do is lead to ruin. And I get it, okay? I get it. Like, I understand that you're struggling. I understand that you're dealing with feelings of insecurity, of self-doubt, that you've had, like, crazy religious abuse and all of this other stuff. Like, I get it. I get it. But at the same time, we can't allow false prophets and grifters who prey on our insecurity to be a crutch or an excuse not to develop healthy coping mechanisms and to deal with our problems head on. And don't think that I don't know, because I, I understand that, of course, there's going to be those people that don't want to have that come to Jesus moment. They don't want to ever have to admit to themselves like, hey, I am the problem or hey, I made bad decisions or hey, maybe I am really lazy and that's why I'm in the predicament that I'm in and that I don't have the things that I covet of all of these other people that I claim are actually worshiping Satan and all this other stuff. Like, actually, I'm the problem. I get that people don't want to do that. That's why they go down these rabbit holes looking for literally anybody who will say whatever their itching ears wants to hear. But why did God send us teachers and prophets and evangelists to begin with? Let's look it up. Ephesians 4. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood or personhood or womanhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes." So when you're built up, when you're listening to people who are actually urging you to read your Bible yourself, to search the scriptures, to see if the things that they're saying are true, the reason that people like that are sent to you is to build you up in the faith so that you're no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Who's doing these deceitful schemes? The minions of Satan, the false prophets, the grifters, these con men, these wolves in sheep's clothing. This is why I'm here to tell you these people are false teachers. Crack your Bible and see what scripture has to say about it. This is why we judge these people because the New Testament tells us over and over and over again to test people by their fruits, to judge those inside the church, that we're going to judge angels. So how much more the matters of this life? Because I want you to be equipped for every good work. So that you're not blown about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. 
Every single one of us has a job within the body of Christ. And we all work together. When one of us is hurting, when one of us is led astray, a body can't go in two directions. And if we have one person pretending to be a leader, rather than keeping our eyes focused on Jesus, we cannot march forward into Satan's territory and tear his kingdom down. What does Revelation say? What's going to happen? The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The day is coming where we are going to see Jesus make all things new, where this kingdom is destroyed. But right now, our job is to go in and bind the strong men and take those captives to set them free so that they can be free in Christ Jesus. But we can't do that if you have part of the body going in one direction instead of marching forward, looking on Jesus, looking in the direction that Jesus is pointing us towards. And how do we know which way Jesus is pointing us towards? We look at his word. We meditate on his word day and night. We look at what the scripture has to say. And when we are constantly meditating on the word of God. The Holy Spirit will guide us and to teach us into all things. But we can't hear the Holy Spirit if we're constantly looking for people to say what our itching ears want to hear. What does Second Timothy chapter 4 say? I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober minded, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Christians, I get it. You've been through stuff. Again, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility to deal with the drama, to deal with the feelings of insecurity, of feeling the jealousy and the covetousness. You cannot allow these things that have happened to you to lead you down the rabbit hole, to lead you down the path where you're susceptible to the grifters and the con men who tell you what your itching ears want to hear, which is that you have some special knowledge and that's why you're better than everybody else. And even though they have more things than you, they have a better family than you, they have more money than you, they have a better position than you, that you're actually superior to them because you have all of this secret knowledge. You're always learning, but you're never going to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's time you get real with yourself. It's time to have that come to Jesus moment. It's time to be real with yourself. You're lonely. You're scared. You feel inferior to others. You feel jealousy. Admit it. You have to admit those things first. You cannot allow these things to consume you because it's going to lead you to tolerating those false prophets like that woman teaching at the church of Thyatira, who's going to be on her sickbed while her children die. And everyone who followed after her also meets the same fate. Christians, it's time to get real. I don't want to hear another person telling me, oh, don't judge. The Old Testament's not applicable. God is the only one who can say anything about what these men or women are teaching. How dare you judge them? I I don't want to hear this anymore because these people are destroying Jesus's flock. And if you love Jesus, you will protect his sheep. Every single one of us has a job to do within the body of Christ. And yes, we're supposed to go out there and show the love of Christ to others. We're supposed to preach the gospel and be God's hands and feet. But Jesus warned us to be on the lookout for those who would creep in as wolves and devour his flock. This is why 
God it doesn't want us to just preach the love of God, but also the justice of God, the righteousness of God, why he calls us to be holy because he is holy. This is why we're called not only to teach, but to reprove and rebuke because it is our obligation to protect God's flock from those who would creep in to destroy it because Satan goes around like a roaring lion looking for those to devour. Ultimately, everybody's going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to have to give an accounting for every thoughtless word and deed that they've ever done. I don't want to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say, yeah, Jesus, I know that there is false teachers that you specifically told me to be on the lookout for because they're going to go in and creep in like wolves in sheep's clothing to devour your flock. But I didn't want to upset people. I didn't want people to unsubscribe. I didn't want to lose friends or family because I called out the false teachings that they hold dear as if they're scripture, whether it's their politics or some crazy conspiracy. I, I didn't want to upset them, Jesus. No, I'm not going to do that. And neither should you. So that's why I'm going to continue to call out false prophets that are devouring Jesus's flock. Because I know that he wants to go after even one lost sheep and bring them back into the fold. I hope you guys will also stand against the false teachers, the false prophets, the conmen, the grifters, the swindlers who have no part in the kingdom of heaven. I hope you will take a stand against them as well instead of placating people with itching ears because real people's souls are on the line. If Jesus will go after one lost sheep, then all of us should be on guard against wolves in sheep's clothing. I hope we're all on the same page. Think about who needs to hear this message and share this video with them. I'll talk to you guys later. Love you guys lots. Bye.